Good evening. It's time for our Bible study. And once again, I welcome you and thank you for taking time out to join with us as we study the Word of God. I think this is an awesome, awesome study. But of course, uh, it's one of those things God spoke to me about. I trust he'll speak to you about it as well. But before we get into the study, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to minister to us in a very special way today. Holy Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a holy, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you are eternal, that you are almighty. And God, today, there's so many things we could ask of you, but I ask you specifically today for a few things. I ask you, Father, to give peace, not peace in the world because that's not going to happen. But we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that you would minister to them. But we pray for peace of mind. We pray for uh, comfort and strength that people have lost loved ones. We know that you do that. We also know, Father, that you're able to give us peace in the midst of the biggest storms. And you'll bring us through those storms. And we thank you for it. But also we pray for those that are sick those that are needing a touch in their body. We know that you're not only our peace, but you are our healer. You are a restorer. You are our hope. So we ask you to minister to us in these things and let your word come alive to us today. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight as we get into the scriptures, I was uh, planning on doing just a one segment but I realized that there's no way I can cover it all in one. So this will be a series, probably just a two-part series. But today we're going to get started uh, into it. And this is our topic. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Now, what brought that to my mind? That's an old, old saying that I heard years and years ago. And I've even preached that thought. But I saw a t-shirt recently that really, really ministered to me and caused me to, to think and ask the question, what am I doing for heaven's sake? The t-shirt said this, heaven is my home. I'm just here on a recruiting trip. Yes, I saw that at a track meet. Yes, I know it relates to sports, but I also know that this Christian man, this coach was making a great statement. Heaven is my home. I'm just here on a recruiting trip. In other words, I want to see who I can take to heaven with me. Now, I don't know about you, but that speaks volumes to me. I had to ask myself the question, how's the recruiting going? How's the recruitment going? Am I recruiting people? Am I encouraging people to go with me to my home, going with me to my team, to join my team? I had to ask myself the question, am I building the team or am I just occupying the spot on the bench? Now I'd like for you to ask yourself that question. What am I on earth am I doing for heaven's sake? How's my recruitment going. Now, normally some of you would say, well, you know, I'm not called to preach. I'm not called to be a Sunday school teacher. I'm a, a janitor. I'm a mechanic or I'm a teacher. And we could go on and on. All of them are, are good things, but we need to remember that we also are on assignment. Yes, we have jobs to take care of. We have jobs that we have to do, and that's part of the curse, remember? You'd have to earn our living by the sweat of our brow. So that's part of the curse. We do have to earn our living, but we also are here with an assignment. What is our assignment? Well, no, we know it could be worded many ways, but we know that he tells us that we're to preach the gospel. We're to share the good news, that we are his people to share the good news. What is his assignment? Well, what does assignment look like? What does a recruiter look like? What is our responsibility? 
Or maybe I should just say again, what on earth are we doing for heaven's sake? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're called ambassadors. Now, let's read that setting. Go back to chapter 5, and we're going to start reading at verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. King James Version said constrains us, keeps us. The love of Christ is what keeps us keeping on. The love of Christ is what we need to be motivated by. It says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. See, death for the believer is not even close to being the end. It's really the beginning. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We could say he's changed teams. He changed from the being on Satan's team to being on God's team, from being on a dead team to being on a live team, from being on a losing team to being on a winning team. It says he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's another point that we could be sharing, but not right now. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation or making it where they qualified to join heaven's team. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Hear that? God making his appeal. We want to recruit you to be on our team. We want to recruit you to be part of the family of God. We want to recruit you to spend eternity in heaven with us. We want to recruit you to have a God that you can call on day and night. It says we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, or we might become on his team. Now, reading one more verse, working together with him, not by ourselves, but working together with him, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, we're saying, listen, don't just hear an invitation from the recruiter. Don't just sit down in your living room or maybe at church and hear the recruiter telling you, look what you can have. Look what you can have and just let that grace or that invitation become null and void. Now, it says ambassadors. Now, chances are you know what the current definition of ambassador is. But if not, let me just share a definition of ambassador from the current dictionary. An ambassador is a diplomatic agent of the highest rank, accredited to a foreign government as the resident representative of his or her own government or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. (laughs) Now, I can tell you that uh, that just resonated with me when I was thinking about I'm here on a recruiting trip because it's not long term. You say, well, pastor, you're getting pretty old. Listen, compared to eternity, this recruiting trip is a drop in the bucket. It is nothing. But while I'm here, I've had to ask, how's my recruiting going? But 
we're also realizing, did you catch that? It says that is a representative of his or her own government. In other words, we are representatives. We are ambassadors for heaven. Now, that's the current definition. Now, keep that definition in mind. Let me share with you the Greek word. And I have to tell you, when I first read this, I said, well, I don't know if that really fits. But the longer I looked at it, I realized it does fit. Because, see, the word translated ambassador is presbo. That uh, the Greek word or the word that is we use to get the word presbyter from. Now, it literally means elder. Now, I know some of you be say, well, listen, that rules me out. I'm just a young person. I'm just a new believer. I'm just, I'm, I'm not a, a, a elder. But it also is translated presbyter or person with leadership ability. And you, you say that cuts me out. But think about it. If you've been a Christian for one year, that means you've got one year of eldership, one year of training that a non-believer does not have. I remember when I was just a teenager, literally still a teenager, I think I was 17 or 18, that we were electing board members at our church. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, it was a small church, a little church, and so we're not talking about being a board member of a major corporation, but someone wanted to nominate me for the board. And they asked the director, our district official that was conducting the meeting, well, how old do you need to be? Because it tells us that we're not to be a novice, to be a, a board member. Now, he explained to us that the word novice had nothing to do with age. It meant with spiritual maturity. It meant how we were mature in Christ. And I can tell you, I was elected as board member. Was I really qualified? Probably not. Was I really an elder? Certainly not in age. But the church needed me on that board. And so I can tell you, regardless of your age, if you are a born-again believer, you have already been appointed as an ambassador. You may not be asked to preach. You may not be asked to teach but you are asked to be a recruiter, a recruiter for the kingdom of God. Now, let's look at that a little bit more closely by going to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, Paul had been converted several years by this time, and he would qualify as an elder. But the reality was, he says, he says, I'm an ambassador. I'm a representative in chains. Now, we think, well, how in the world did that, that happen? How could he say, I'm ambassador in change? See, Paul was, had been arrested. He was literally in prison. And they handcuffed him or changed him to his guard. And so every shift, there was a guard that was with uh, Paul. They considered him such a danger. But I can assure you that Paul didn't consider it an, a, a, a negative thing to be chained to a prisoner. He said, I'm not chained to him. He's chained to me. So now I am an ambassador for Christ. I'm an ambassador in chains, but I can tell them that God has something much better, that they can change teams, that they can become a believer, that I can recruit them for heaven. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. But then again, talks about that term ambassador. But I went over to the New Testament and read a story, a parable told by Jesus in chapter 14 of Luke, where it says in verse 28, 
For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, he is not able to finish. All who see it again will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a long way off, he sends a delegation, a delegation, and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, anyone who does not come, renounce all those, he cannot be my disciple. Now in verse 32, that word delegation, guess what it was in the original. Yes, it's the same word that's translated. Delegation is the same word that's translated ambassador. And what is an ambassador? An agent of the highest rank, accredited to a foreign government as the resident representative, often on temporary diplomatic assignment. God has appointed you. He's appointed me to be recruiters. Be recruiters. That's kind of amazing. And it says here that word, he's interesting, he says, and ask for terms of peace. As we look around us and see the world in turmoil, we realize that as long as sin is in the world, there will never be a world at peace. Job says, I have not peace no quietness, I have no rest, only turmoil. The prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all said there is no peace for the wicked. One of the terms for God is Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. Now this is just my take on it. You don't have to agree with it. But in the book of Revelations, it talks about there'll be no more sea. Now, what does that mean? Again, this is my take. Because throughout the Bible, the world is uh, the word sea often attributed at, to turmoil, to uh, being at rest, like the waves of the sea, always being moving, always being in turmoil. But one of these days in heaven, there will be no more sea, no more turmoil, no more agitation. And I know you may say, well, I don't have any agitation. Well, I'm sure there's some of the rest of those that are listening tonight, they could be glad to share some of their agitation. But in heaven, there's total peace. There's no more turmoil. Years ago, I was asked to sell the World Book Encyclopedia. Now for you younger people, that's Google in printed form. And I told the guy, I said, I'm not a salesman. And he said, what do you mean you're not a salesman? You sell the greatest product in all the world. It's got the greatest guarantee and it costs nothing. Of course, he was talking about salvation. And yes, he convinced me to sell World Book Encyclopedia and I proved to him that I was not a salesman. He was a better salesman than me. He convinced me to do it. But I will always remember those words. You have the greatest product in all the world. You have a product that everybody needs and you don't have to have money to buy it. So think about it. Think about that, that you are a recruiter. Heaven is my home. I'm just here on a recruiting trip. So I ask you again in closing, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I know there's many that heard this message and we hear this message that are working diligent for you. They're doing everything they can do. But God, some of us are just kind of sitting on the bench. We're not really actively recruiting people to follow you, to recruit people to come to salvation. 
Father, I realize when a recruiter from a college goes to a high school kid, they have only a certain number of scholarships they can give. But I'm so glad that there's no restriction on heaven, that there's no restriction on heaven. And if it's not big enough, you'll add on to it because we know that you want everyone. Your word tells us that you're not willing that one should perish. So help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to recruit people for heaven. And God, we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I encourage you in closing today to go out, get busy, and let's do something for the kingdom of God. Have a blessed day, and we'll pick up here next Sunday.